Hello and welcome back to Jason Live. My name is Patrick Shea. We're here once again with our STEM career series where we learn about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models currently working in those fields. Today's STEM role model is Kamini Singha. Kamini is a hydrologist and professor at the Colorado School of Mines where she does research and teaches about issues related to water. We're going to connect with Kamini in just a moment to learn all about her work and the path she took to get where she is today. But before we do, I just want to remind everybody out there that today's live event is live and interactive. You can send us questions and participate in our polls. To do so, just use the box right below this video window. We're going to try to get as many of you involved today as we can. But right now, it's time to get Kamini involved. Welcome, Kamini. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. So um, we're very interested in all things to do with water. Um, so <coughs> maybe you can kind of kick things off. There's, there's a lot of different aspects to water. Um, which areas of water do you focus on? What does a hydrologist do? And you know, what, how do you spend your days? Sure. Um, so there's a lot of problems um, out there in the Earth system right now associated with water. And most people that study hydrology study one of two things, either how much water is available. And that's interesting to you, because if you were going to build a house um, or you're going to live up in the mountains, you want to know how much water was available to you to use. The other thing we study is groundwater contamination, for instance, or lake contamination, stream contamination how some of the uh, chemicals that we use for agriculture and other things um, end up in the water bodies that we look at. And we use a bunch of really interesting tools to, to make that happen. Um, in terms of a day in the life, it varies greatly. Um, the video you're showing right now is uh, some field work. And uh, we spend a lot of time outdoors and uh, trying to understand what's happening both beneath our feet in terms of where water moves. Um, there is no underground river um, when we are interested in where water comes from beneath our feet. It's actually coming out of, say, the space between sand grains down there. Um, and so we spend a lot of times uh, outside trying to figure out what the earth looks like. And then we spend a lot of time uh, indoors, analyzing the data that we collect. Um, so it's a, it's a really fun job in that um, we get to travel a great deal, which is a lot of fun. Uh, I get to work with some great people. Um, and we get to work on some really important and interesting problems in the, wor in the, the world's Earth system. It sounds cool. Well, um, folks have already been sending in a lot of questions for you. So we're going to start to uh, jump into those right now. Great. And our first one is right here. This is from students in Mrs. Bounds' class. Uh, and they're interested in, in the tools and equipment that you use. They say, in the picture on the JSON website, what is the equipment you are using? What were you studying? And where were you? Yeah, um, that picture on the website, I think I know the one that you're talking about. It's got me in glasses with sort of a big rig. Um, that's the one. Um, that is a drill rig, actually. It's a tiny, tiny drill rig. So um, people that explore for oil and gas that you would put in your car use very big drill rigs. Um, some hydrologists like myself use really small ones because, as you can see from the photo, um, you know we're in the woods and it's very hard to get any sort of vehicle in here. So this is a small, about 600-pound drill rig that you can roll into place uh, with about six people. And um, it allows us to drill holes that are maybe 30 feet uh, down underneath the ground. And, um, and from those holes, we can measure where the water is. And so we can tell if that water level goes up or down. And that says something about changes in, in the amount of water that's available. We also use a lot of tools that are sort of like x-rays that you would have on the human body um, to sort of look at the, the earth beneath our feet as well. Um, so we use some um, tools like that. And we put them down inside of the boreholes to take a look at what's happening at the earth around us, um, because unfortunately, we don't fit inside the boreholes. Um, so that photo is a, a tiny little rig. Yeah, we've got a couple other questions related to tools and equipment. Um, a bunch of other students in Ms. Bounds' class ask, what is your favorite tool that you use as a hydrologist and why? And what kind of, what other kinds of equipment do you use in your work as well? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, the drill rig is one of my favorites because it is just really fun to be on this, this big drill rig. Um, so I do actually think that that's quite a lot of fun. Um, we use the, some of the geophysical tools we use have lots and lots of cables. Um, so geophysics is basically another word for um, you know, these x-ray type instruments. And you see here um, what we're doing is we're putting some of that instrumentation down inside of a borehole. And you see all this cable on the ground. But what we're going to do is make some sort of x-ray images of the ground 
And from that, we can say not only what do the rocks look like, but we can actually say something about how the water is moving, and in some cases, even how contaminants, so things that are in our water that we don't want, how those are moving too. Um, so those might be some of my favorite instruments, um, just because getting pictures of the ground, it's like getting an x-ray of yourself. That's really cool. Um, getting a picture of what the ground looks like is also really exciting. Our next question is from Kendra. She wants to know, uh, could you please speak about hydraulic fracturing and groundwater pollution? D is, does this come into play in your work at all? It does. Um, I haven't worked directly too much on hydraulic fracturing. It is something that is um, politically is sort of a, an issue that is very touchy with some people. People seem to fall on one end or of the spectrum or the other in terms of being pro-fracking or against fracking. Um, for those of you that haven't heard of fracking, the idea is breaking the rock in the subsurface and the ground so that you can get some of the, the oil and gas out more efficiently. Um, and it's a sort of a contentious um, process for some people because there's some question about how the uh, very salty water that is in the ground, um, which is often where these, these reservoirs of oil and gas are, what to do with it when it comes back up to the surface. Um, generally, fracking is, in general, actually a safe process. I think that the engineers working on it want it to be a safe process. Um, but there are two places where it fails, and it frequently fails along the borehole itself. So we drill that hole, and, um, and then what we usually do is put a piece of metal or a piece of plastic down inside of the hole to keep it open. And sometimes those contaminants from fracking go up the side of the borehole. Uh, so up the side of the well. So that's one place uh, where fracking can impact groundwater. And um, the other is when all this contaminated water comes up to the surface, um, it, storing it on the surface in ponds is also a, a practice that can happen. And then those ponds can leak. So the two biggest problems in terms of groundwater contamination have to do with well bore um, contamination, so the boreholes themselves, and then also the storage on the surface. Um, no company wants to contaminate a place just because it's very expensive. All right, we're going to jump into another question here. This one's from Danielle. How deep do you dig when you do your research? Yeah, um, it depends a little bit, Danielle. Um, it turns out that um, it depends on what kind of tools we have. So sometimes we're li limited to shovels and digging pits. And if we're uh, digging pits, we might only get down um, a few feet, um, three, four, five feet. Um, and then we'd be looking at mostly soil. If we want to look at the rock, we usually can't dig in with the shovel. So then we would get a drill rig, like the one we were just talking about. And, um, and then we might get down tens of feet, maybe as deep as 100 feet. Um, sometimes we use bigger drill rigs, and we can get down as deep as you know, 300, 400 feet. But most of the water that we drink is coming from that top little skin on the earth that's only 300 or 400 feet. So we don't look too much deeper than that, usually. We have a bunch of questions here. Uh, kids are really interested in bacteria mm -hmm. and pollution. So I'm going to fire a bunch of these your way. And uh, you can tackle them in any order that makes sense. Um, what was the dirtiest or most polluted <laughs> water you have found? Has testing the water for bacteria ever affected the wildlife around or in the water you're testing? Have you ever discovered a new bacteria in water you have studied? And when you study water, are there ever dangerous bacteria in it? And what do you do with the living organisms? So lots Those of are, stuff yeah. to think about there, but why don't you uh, talk about pollution and bacteria for us? Absolutely. Um, so bacteria is a really interesting problem. Here in the United States, we spend a lot of time making sure that there isn't bacteria in the water that comes out of our taps. The water that, um, that you get in your sink is incredibly clean and has gone through a very stringent process to become the water that you can drink. But in other countries in the, around the world, that's not necessarily the case. Um, I work a fair bit in Western Africa in a country uh, known as Ghana. And uh, there we have been working on a bacterial uh, problem. I am not a biologist, and so I don't work a lot on, on bacteria themselves, but I work with a lot of scientists that do. And so these are um, some scientists that I work with on the Ghanaian project, and uh, we're doing some water sampling, and we're looking for the presence of a bacteria that actually eats flesh. And so um, one of the concerns we've had is um, this is a disease that impacts a lot of children. Um, in Ghana, and you'll see these lesions that are formed from a, a flesh-eating bacteria. And so there are places around the world that um, have some, some pretty interesting and pretty scary diseases, and we're lucky here in the United States to really not have a lot of those problems. Um, but um, there are some bacterial issues in, in other parts of the world of great concern. 
big smile on your face here as I assume <laughs> you do not have any flesh eating bacteria. We have managed to escape the flesh eating bacteria. That's, yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> um, Mrs. Bounds class, another question. Um, they want to know what are the biggest challenges you face in your work? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different challenges I could mention. Everything from carrying a lot of heavy field equipment around in the field. Sometimes that can um, be really hard on tough terrain. Um, but I think the hardest part of my job right now is that I actually have to get money to conduct all these, these science projects. And um, trying to get that money uh, so that I can pay to have students working with me and um, to be out in these, these areas and to travel is, um, can be hard sometimes. So for me, the hardest part is often raising money to do the really interesting science that we want to do. We've got a question next from Jim. Jim wants to know, what can we do about the quiet movement that is underway towards privatizing water? Wow, that's a tough question, Jim. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question that, um, again, varies significantly around the world in terms of um, the idea being that you know the most water is, is public and is given to us by public companies and then there's a sense of of trying to make these systems more efficient by by having private companies run them and with mixed success I would say um, you know there are places where privatizing has worked well but there are a lot of places where it's worked very poorly um, and a lot of people have been marginalized by that um, and so there's a uh, you know, a, a great body of research in terms of both the, the pros and the cons of, of of having privately owned water. You know, it's a it's a, a resource that we all need to survive. So it can't be so expensive that we can't afford to have it. Um, in terms of what to do, though, that's a that's an interesting question and probably a little outside of what I know a lot about in terms of who to talk to about water privatization. But I suppose your local government might be a good place to start. Um, just to find out sort of where your water comes from and any movements towards privatization. Um, but that, that's, that's actually a tough question for me. Yeah, that's a big issue, and uh, thanks for trying to tackle it here with us today. Um, <laughs> we're going to move on to our next question from Trencia. I, I hope I'm getting that right. What part of the Earth do you look at with your X-ray-like tools? Yeah, um, we look at the very shallow subsurface, so everything beneath our feet. Um, and we can look down, again, maybe as deep as 100 feet, a couple hundred feet, um, and, uh, and maybe over distances of, you know, again, hundreds of feet. Um, and so what we're often interested in is, let's say there's a spill of some sort of contaminant. We'll call it methyl, ethyl, bad stuff. And that spills on the ground. What we're interested in is where that migrates. And so um, understanding where in the subsurface are the easy, the permeable pathways, the places where things can move easily, like a fracture, for instance, um, that requires um, us to have these sort of x-ray-like tools. The only other option is just putting in wells. That's what this picture is here um, that allows us to get point measurements um, of you know, chemical concentrations, et cetera. But the nice thing about the x-rays is that they allow us to have a more spatially distributed picture, um, so a better sense of, of, of coverage in the ground, more, um, more data than we would normally otherwise get. We've got a question from Nick. This is kind of another water-related issue. Um, in my science class, we were talking about the chances of a 100-year flood. Is it even possible that a flood so extreme won't happen for another 100 years? So this is kind of a... You know, another, uh, you know, a lot of things relate to water. How does this relate to your work? Absolutely. Um, so the interesting thing about these, these statistics, like a 100-year flood frequency, means that there is a likelihood of something happening within the next 100 years. But that doesn't mean by any, by any means that it will happen, if this is answering your question, I hope. Um, so it, it could mean that you get a, a flood, in a, you know, a flood of that magnitude in 100 years. It could mean that you get three in the next three years, it could mean you don't see any for a thousand years. So it, it just is the most probable um, explanation is that we'll see a flood of that magnitude in a hundred years. But it doesn't necessarily mean that has to happen. And that just is a, a function of the statistics that we use to describe those sorts of processes. So we've talked about a lot about the research side of your career, but Alex has a question about your teaching. He says, when teaching, what's the hardest thing you have to deal with? Um, that's a great question, Alex. Um, I think that for me, at least, the hardest part is um, is remembering what a hard time I had with some of the concepts so that I can do a good job of explaining them. 
um, we forget as scientists sometimes how much we know about this one little tiny thing that we work on. And so trying to convey our enthusiasm for our subjects and making sure that we explain it in a way that students can understand, um, to me that is one of the hardest things. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm constantly trying to figure out um, just how to, how to convey complex uh, concepts in a simple way that other people will understand. All right, so uh, we've hit a point in the program now where we need to move on, and we're going to talk now about your career path. How did you come to be um, in the career that you're in right now? So uh, we have a question that's going to get us going on this topic. This is from Maddie. She wants to know, why are you a hydrologist? Yeah, um, it, was, it was a little bit of a fluke how I ended up here, Maddie, to be honest. Um, part of the reason I ended up as a hydrologist is I really liked ma math and science when I was in um, middle school and in high school. Um, and then I wanted to do a science that allowed me to feel like I was making a difference in the world. I wanted to do something that uh, was important to the planet, and water is certainly one of those, those fields. And so I ended up in hydrology because I thought the problems were really interesting and the people were really interesting. So that's kind of how I ended up here. We've got some related questions. We've got a lot of related questions, and I need to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got a couple here. How long... Have you been a hydrologist, and how long have you been a scientist? I'm, I'm going to assume that those are probably the same amount of time. Have you ever been a different kind of scientist? A little bit. Um, I was a geophysicist for a while, so I focused a little bit more on the physics of things for a while, but I'm still sort of doing the same thing. Um, I guess I started uh, right when I started college was um, when I started getting interested in this field. Um, in high school, I really liked English, actually. It was my favorite um, my favorite subject, and I thought maybe I would be an English major. But I had this really great physics teacher in high school that really inspired me to think about physics. And um, so starting in college, I started taking classes in physics and also in geology, um, just the study of rocks. And I got to be outside, which was really fun. And so, um, so I was about 18 when I started thinking about science as a career path. And so that's almost been 20 years now, which is crazy. We have a great follow-up from Alessandra. Uh, what did your high school physics teacher do to inspire you? You mentioned that you were inspired, but w what was the mechanism of inspiration? Yeah. You know, um, it was a number of things, and I hope he's out there somewhere and just knows how much I value him as a high school teacher. Um, he just loved what he was doing. And I think you guys probably have those teachers that are so fun to be in the classroom with, right? And and how much they make you love that, that field just because they're so excited about it. And he, um, he loved physics. And I couldn't help but love physics, too, just because he was so fun. And he just loved what he was teaching. And he really cared about the students. And somewhere in there, I just got swept up in his love of physics. So, um, so he sort of inspired just by his own enthusiasm for the field. And I hope that I can convey that to my students as well. Our next question is from Lucy, who has clearly <laughs> done her homework and <laughs> read your profile questions. Um, and she noticed in there that you said you didn't think you were smart enough when you went to grad school, I believe it was. And yeah. uh, she wants to know, why didn't you think you were smart enough? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's not an uncommon thing, I think, for people to think they're not smart enough. Um, there's so many smart people on the planet, and we look around and we compare ourselves to someone else and just think, gosh, that person is so much smarter than me. We do it in the, our classes all the time, right? I bet there's someone in your class right now that you think about as being really smart. Um, but it took me a while to realize that we have skills in a lot of different areas, that, um, that there's certain kinds of smart, like book smart, that don't necessarily mean that you're good with people um, or good at organizing or good at coming up with ideas. And it took me a little while early on to realize what kind of smart I was. Um, and or you know, the combination of different types of smart that was going to allow me to be successful. Um, but I, at first I thought it was all about just getting A's and um, being the best at math or, or whatever. But there are a lot of ways to be successful. And especially in science, we need a lot of really creative people that can think about problems in new ways. And so um, I didn't think I was smart enough because I didn't realize that there were a bunch of different kinds of smart that allow us to be successful. That's a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, we have a couple other questions that we're going to squeeze into your career path segment here. These are from Kristen and Jenna. Kristen wants to know, what was your favorite job ever? And Jenna asks, has finding this job changed your life and how? Okay. 
Um, well, I do think my favorite job is the one that I have now, um, which is part researcher and part teacher. So I'm a university professor, and um, it's just a great job. Um, in terms of this job changing my life, absolutely. Um, what an amazing gift of a job it is. I get to work with students all the time. Um, they come in, they have a lot of great ideas, they're fun to be around. Um, I am so happy to be around these really interesting, smart human beings every day. I cannot imagine what my life would look like if I was sitting in an office just, you know, typing out spreadsheets. You know, for me, that just wouldn't have been a job that, that fit me. The idea that I can be outside, that I can be with students, that I can talk to smart people about the earth, I mean, what an amazing thing to get to be able to do. So um, it has changed my life, and what's changed my life most is the people. Awesome. We're going to move on now from talking about your career path, and it's actually time, you know, we've asked you a lot of questions. It's time for comedy to ask some questions of you. So <laughs> we're going to do our poll questions now. And uh, let's jump into the first poll question that Comedy came up with. Why did Comedy get into studying water? Is it A, because of the other people who study water? B, because the problem seemed important and interesting? C, because it seemed like a profession where there were lots of jobs? Or D, all of the above? Now, I think I remember you talking about some of these points just a couple minutes ago. So we're going to open up our, our interactive polling tool and give our uh, audience a couple of seconds here to enter in their answers and we'll see what they come up with. So we've got some responses coming in now. So far, I think uh, most folks are guessing B because the problem seemed important and interesting. No, nope, now we're getting some, uh, some responses for all of the above. And I think we're, we're pretty balanced between those. Uh, all of the above has taken the lead. <laughs> all of the above with 67%, 75% now. Uh, the answers keep on coming in. Comedy, why don't you tell us what is the right answer? Well, the right answer actually is D, um, all of the above. I didn't talk quite as much about C this particular time, so I could see throwing people off by that. But um, it's certainly the people are a huge part of me being in this. The problems are super interesting. And for those of you interested in science, we are going to need people to study water for the rest of time. It is a great place to get a job. There you go. We're going to move on to poll number two. When we use wells to get drinking water, where does the water come from? Does it come from A, underground rivers, B, buried tanks, C, the space between rock pieces, or D, the core of the earth? What do you think? We're going to ask you guys to um, vote now. I don't know. Did we talk about this at all earlier? For one sentence. There's like a one very sentence. brief mention, I think. <laughs> I think you said it was not one of these things. I did say it was yeah. not one of these things. So there's a hint. Yeah, this might be a hard one. It could be. I don't, well, I guess you did tell me what the right answer was, but I've probably forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make you guess. I, I will guess in a <laughs> sec. But right now, I'm, I'm seeing answers coming in from our audience. I don't want to taint their, their guesses. Of course. Of so course. right now, 63% think the space between rock pieces, and 33% think underground rivers. You have not tempted anybody with the core of the <laughs> earth, <laughs> which sounds terrifying and dangerous. <laughs> to drill a well that deep into uh, the, the molten core of the earth. So I think we can rule that out. We're, nobody's guessing that. Everybody, uh, I won't say everybody, the vast majority of our audience thinks C, the space between rock pieces, and I agree with them. What's the right answer? That is correct. So um, it turns out that there are um, basically no underground rivers. That is a very common misconception to think that there is just water flowing in rivers under the ground. Um, that actually doesn't happen because all the rock is in the way. So the water just moves between all the little rock pieces down there. Um, and so the water that we get is actually happening from in between the sand grains and things that are beneath our feet. So it's, it's kind of an interesting place where the water is stored. Tiny, tiny spaces. Interesting. Well, this is a, a good segue into poll number three. How do water scientists understand what happens below their feet? Is it A, they put their ear to the ground and listen? 
Is it B, they guess based on their understanding of what water does? Is it C, they use geophysical methods and they drill holes on the ground? Or is it D, they borrow x-ray machines from doctors? Now, you've been kind of tricky here. I, I think uh -huh. there are a couple of answers that sound uh -huh. like they could be true. And, you know, you've talked about some of this stuff. But there is no all of the above option here. Nope, that's true. So you're going to have to pick one, audience. Pick your best option. Yeah. So far, the, uh, let's see, C is in the lead with 60%. Folks out there right now, 67% think they use geophysical methods and they drill holes in the ground to understand what's going on down there. 75% now think that's the right answer. So uh, a few people think A, a few people think D, but now 80% think it's C. Comedy, what's the right answer? It is C. Um, so the people that chose D were probably misled by the fact that I was saying x-rays, but we actually don't use the same instruments as doctors. We have our own, so that's a little different. Um, the people that guessed A, um, actually you are not entirely wrong, which is that there are a specific class of methods that people can use to listen, but it's very uncommon. Um, so C is certainly the most common way that people understand what's happening beneath their feet. Fascinating. So we've got one last poll question here. What did Comedy initially want to major in in college? Was it English, math, biology, or juggling? A, B, C, or D. We're not going to take too much time with this. And another hint, I'm pretty sure you gave the answer to this earlier. I did. Yet another hint, I don't remember us talking about juggling. I'm really bad at it. <laughs> I will give that one away right now. So we can rule that one out. Uh, <laughs> did Was that even an option anywhere you went to college? Was there a juggling major? There probably wasn't. There was puppetry, though, at my undergrad institution. All right. That would have been a better distractor. Probably true. All right. So 78% at the moment think it is A, English. They think that you wanted to major in English. 30% uh, think biology. What's the right answer, Comedy? It's English. Yeah, I really thought I wanted to be a writer when I was younger. And what happened? I had a physics teacher that just changed my whole life. Yeah, I, uh, but now I get to write a lot, actually. I just get to write a lot of science. So it's a good use of my English skills. All right, we're going to move on now. We're going to talk about the future. So this mm -hmm. is comedy's future and also the future of students out there. And we've got questions that have come in related to the future. And this first one, I'm going to scroll down and find it, past all of these polls. Uh, this first one is from Mrs. Bounds' class. How has your work evolved over time, and what do you anticipate for the future of hydrology? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a field that is only going to continue to boom. Um, this planet it has a population that is growing and growing and growing. We have 9 billion people, sorry, 7 billion people on this planet, and we are trying to figure out how to get water to all of these people. It's a, a resource that we all need just to survive. And so... Um, I think one of the pressing problems that's going to exist for when you guys potentially go to college is how to get water to all of these people. Um, there are places that have a lot of water, like Canada, and there are places that have very little, like parts of Australia. And so how do we, how do we move water around? How do we get people in the right places? I think that the future of hydrology has a lot to do with um, understanding how to get water to people, especially in the face of a changing climate. We're going to move on to our next question. What is your life goal in science? Ooh, man. That's that a big a one. Great question. That's a tricky question. Um, you know, I think that probably my, my primary goal is to get other people excited about science. Um, there are so many important and interesting questions that happen in the Earth right now, and we don't have a lot of people studying Earth science. Um, at least when I went to school, the last time we saw Earth science was in the eighth grade. Um, we didn't see it in high school. And so a lot of people interested in science don't think about geology or hydrology or environmental science as possible careers, and yet we really need smart people in those areas. So um, a lot of that's going to happen at the junior high and the high school level, getting people excited about earth science. But um, I'm hoping to, to pick up my end of the deal here with the slightly older students um, and try to get them to think that this is a really
really important career path that they should be on. Well, speaking of younger students, uh, Ms. Castillejo's class uh, is a fourth grade classroom in Ohio. They're doing a citizenship science project using a rain garden that they planted at their school. They are collecting and reporting data from the garden. How important do you think rain gardens are? Well, I'm going to have to throw this back to them for a second and ask them to define rain garden for me, just because I don't know the term. I probably know what they're talking about. Um, but if they could tell me what a rain garden specifically is, I think I know what they're talking about, like an area where they're actually introducing water that's infiltrating into the ground, I think. Um, but if they could let me know. All right. We'll keep an eye out here for uh, clarification from yeah, fourth grade students in Ohio. I want to know. I want to know. We'll, we'll swing back around on them if we, uh, if we get some clarification. But we're going to go to a different question now. Benji from Michigan wants to know, what can we do to help prevent water contamination? Yeah, um, there's, a, I guess, a number of small things that we can all do. A lot of uh, contamination comes from things running off on the pavement. So when we use um, soaps and cleaning products outside to wash our cars, a lot of that stuff um, just goes on the pavement and down into drains. Depending on where you live, some of those drains uh, discharge uh, directly to streams and rivers. So um, understanding where sort of water goes within your, your local neighborhood is important. Uh, is it, you know, is all of that water filtered and, and processed, um, you know, such that, that it's not a big deal or if it's discharging directly to streams, that's another, that's another big problem. So I think um, having a good sense of, of what it is, where your water goes is important and trying not to dump things outside. A lot of the old contamination problems that exist in this country come from dumping in the 1960s where you know, the, we didn't have environmental regulations that were very strict. And so people would just kind of dump their waste out the back door and that stuff sticks around for years and years and years, tens and hundreds of years. So being very careful about uh, pu putting away uh, waste appropriately, making sure that you, you know, recycle what you can recycle. Um, I, I think all of these things that we deal with are, are waste is important in terms of keeping water quality good. We've got a, uh, a slightly different type of question here, but kind of along the same lines in terms of uh, good stewardship of water. Um, Ms. Negrin's gate class uh, says that they are studying warming weather and water in the West this year. How mm. would you advise them to handle their drought situation when strict restrictions have not been forced on our city, city its residents, or its businesses? That is such a great question and so timely. Um, this has been a crazy year, especially in California, um, dealing with the droughts that are out there. Even here, Colorado has been the western, uh, the front range where I live has been fairly wet, but parts of the western uh, United States have been very dry this year, and it's hard because there's no meters on our houses at many times, and so we don't know how much water we're using. And I've been talking a lot, actually, right now with a colleague about finding ways to let people know how much water they're using. We get a bill in the you know, mail in the, every month, but it's not like um, we're all very sensitive to gas prices, right? Because when you go to the gas station, you see exactly how much gasoline costs. Your parents know how much it costs to fill their tank. We don't know how much water costs. And so, um, you know, I think that that makes it hard for us to motivate. The thing that we should be doing is just conserving. Um, under all circumstances, just being aware of how much water we're using. And an important thing is how much water goes into making energy. So every time you leave lights on, you are actually using up precious water. And so thinking a lot about turning off the lights, turning off the tap, uh, not wasting water. If you have water in your water bottle and you left sports practice, maybe you could water a plant at home with that. So just thinking a little bit about how to try to conserve as much water as possible. And everyone, you know, if everyone made that little effort, it would be a huge impact. Good advice once again. We're, uh, we're moving right along. We, we're almost out of time. So we're going to jump into uh, a segment that covers kind of your, the personal side of life. So outside of work, you know, what kinds of things do you do and what kind of person are you? And we're going to get a couple questions that will get us started here. One is from a guest, anonymous guest. What's your favorite thing to do in your free time? And Tara asks, what kinds of things do you do when you spend time with your friends? Oh, that, those are great questions. Um, so uh, my favorite thing to do is actually rock climbing. I really like climbing rocks. Um, I also like bicycling. Those are probably my two favorite things. And I do both of those things with my friends often. Um, so my friends and I will go on bicycle rides or we'll go rock climbing together. Um, sometimes we just sit around and we talk. We do a lot of talking. Um, but certainly being outside in nature is one of my very favorite things. So um, any 
anything I can do to get outside, I'll do. Speaking of climbing, uh, we had a question from Alex and Maya. What is ice climbing? Oh, yeah. So ice climbing is really cool, guys. So, um, so you've probably maybe seen rock climbing in movies, at least, where people are climbing up rocks. It's the same idea, but you're climbing up ice, and you have two, they're called ice axes. They kind of look like pointy tools that you have in each hand, and you crawl up the ice with these um, pointy things on your hands and your feet. So it's uh, a little like rock climbing, but with more tools. Kennedy wants to know, how does your job affect your personal life? Yeah, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting job that I have because I do travel a lot. And so the one thing that is um, can be hard is that I'm gone for long periods of time. And so I don't always see my friends and family as often as I would, you know, if I was sticking around more often. Um, at the same time, I get to travel to all these great new places and meet a lot of really interesting people that I would never meet otherwise. So it changes my life in that I have a very broad network of friends across the world that I wouldn't have without this job. Um, but I also don't see my friends that are right down the street quite as often as someone might who works more locally. On a related note, Nadisha wants to know, what are your favorite places to go when you do travel? And Chris and Maddie ask, what is the weirdest place you've been? Ooh. Gosh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Put I you think on the about spot. the weirdest place on. That's a good one. Um, my favorite place to be, um, that's a hard call, but I just went back to Yosemite National Park a couple weeks ago in California, and um, that might be one of my very favorite places. It's just really beautiful. And as someone who studies rocks, it is all rocks, so it's, um, it's really exciting in that regard. Um, the weirdest place I've been. I did a bunch of field work actually in Mississippi on the border with Alabama. And it was a very strange place. It was <laughs> on a military base. It was very weird. Um, but that's a hard question. I have to think more about that one. But um, I've been a number of weird places, but nothing is sticking out right at this moment. <laughs> you might have it explained for, in case we have some viewers out there that are from Mississippi or Alabama, why that particular spot was weird to you. It was weird just because um, I couldn't get on to the research site, ah. actually. Um, so I, I, there was a... Um, we were civilians on a military base, and there's understandably a lot of protection that needs to happen to make sure that no one's getting onto military bases that shouldn't be there. But man, we had some really funny interactions. I made some really good friends with some of the military guys on that base from it, but it took us forever to get on. It was just a weird situation, yeah. for sure. Good, good clarification there. Um, next question from Anissa and Navia. What is your favorite food from another country? I think sushi. I really like sushi, and Japanese food is my favorite, I think. All right, just a few more questions here in the personal category. What's your favorite book, asks Ethan. Ooh, um, that's hard. Um, one of my favorites is The River Why, which is a, a water-themed book, um, but it's about a, uh, a man who's learning to fish. It's a, really, it's a really great book. Do you have any pets? Uh, I don't. I have a bunch of house plants. I travel so much that if I had any pets, it would be very hard on them. They'd be very lonely, as is my house plants look a little lonely. So only house plants for me. But uh, I like other people's pets. Here's another great question from Jalen. How do you describe yourself? Oh, Jalen, that's a good question. Um, angry and mean. No, um, <laughs> I think. Uh, I Clearly think not. Very mean. Uh, I try to think of myself as someone who's uh, pretty optimistic and is excited about where their life lies. And um, I try to be as friendly as I can to people, to everybody. Um, so I guess that's how I see myself. Well, you'll be happy to know that we have a follow-up explanation oh from Miss Castillejo's class. They say a rain garden is a depressed area planted with local flowers and plants. Its purpose is to filter rainwater before it goes into the groundwater. This rainwater would have otherwise run off across the parking lot, picked up pollutants before going into the groundwater. So this sounds a lot uh, right up your alley. It is. Okay, so I do know what they're talking about. Um, that, that is awesome. And I think that there's a lot of um, engineering that's moving in this area right now with, like, green roofs, for instance, mm -hmm. too, where people are trying to uh, plant on roofs so that this water is being used to grow something and that it, it impacts the way um, climate is changing. So we no longer have these hot roofs and hot pavement radiating heat back into the atmosphere, but instead this water is infiltrating and helping to grow something that's sucking up CO2. So these rain gardens and, and things like it are incredibly important, not only for um, 
getting water back into the hydrologic cycle uh, locally, but also for, for keeping our climate cool. So I think that that's a really cool project that you guys are working on. That's really neat. Awesome. We've got a couple questions about danger. Zoe wants to know, what's the most dangerous place you've been to? And Ryan asks, what is the most dangerous thing you have done? Hmm. Um, so that would probably be different, uh, different depending if I was talking about my personal life or my professional life. But in my professional life, I think the most dangerous place I've been and the most dangerous thing I've done are one and the same, which is um, being at an illegal mining camp in Ghana. Um, so there's a bunch of miners who um, are illegally mining, and so they're very protective of their land. There's lots of people with guns. Um, and uh, we were there to sample water. Um, you know, we, we don't look like we're very threatening, so that helps. Uh, but we ended up going down inside of one of the mine shafts. Um, so they're drilling, you know, way down deep to get gold out in these mines. And we went down, I don't even know how many hundreds of feet. It was really hot. and. There's no safety uh, sort of protocol like there would be in the United States for a mine. Um, so that was certainly one of the most dangerous places I've been and one of the most dangerous activities I've done while on the job, at least. Okay, time for just a couple of last questions here. This one's from Monica. If you couldn't have the job you currently have, what job would you have? Oh, Monica, yeah, I've asked like myself that question a thousand times. And uh, you know, coming back to Lucy's question about not being smart enough, for a long time I thought, well, maybe I'm not going to be able to do this job. Maybe I should do something else. And I've had a thousand backup plans from being a yoga instructor to being an electrician to, um, gosh, I was going to do gardening for a while. I had all sorts of plans. But um, I'm, I'm actually so happy with this job. I don't know what I would do if I wasn't a scientist. The people are just so great. But I'd find something. I'd probably be an electrician. There you go. Aurelius and Max want to know, how much fun do you have at your job? <laughs> I have so much fun in my job. Um, so I get to go to all these great places. I get to work with really um, smart and fun people. Um, I get to be outside all day. I mean, it's like all day recess some days. It's, um, it's great. It is one of the very best jobs I could possibly imagine. I have a great time at my job. Um, it's super fun. All right, we're almost out of time. Do you have any kind of last words, uh, advice for our students, or any any words before we go? Sure. I think that um, you should you should figure out what it is that makes you happy in life, and um, and whether that's in the classes that you take or the friends that you make. But you know, try to try to make decisions that allow you to be the happiest person you can, and uh, surround yourself with people that think that you are able to do great things, um, because you you are and uh, to believe in yourself. And man, do we need more scientists. Please become a scientist. That's, that's my final message. We're going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for taking the time today to talk about your work and your career path. It's been really fascinating to chat with you. Thanks, Jason. Patrick. <laughs> that's Patrick, okay. we'll keep it. Trust me, it happens happy. all the time. I all know. the time. All right. If you enjoyed today's program, be sure to come back next week when we connect with budding young chemist Jendai Robinson. Jendai is pursuing her Ph.D. in chemistry at the University of Cincinnati, but also spends a lot of time in the labs at NASA Ames Research Center, where she's a NASA Jenkins Fellow. Her research involves developing biosensors that can detect toxins better than anything we have available on the market today. If you want to learn more about Jendai, her work, and her career path, we're live next Thursday, September 25th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for joining us once again for Jason Learning. I'm Patrick Shea. We'll see you next time on Jason Live.